Hi, this week's podcast is going to be about Hartman's procedure. Hartman's procedure is a very common general surgical procedure performed mostly as an emergency but sometimes electively and during any general surgical attachment either as a student or a trainee you'll come across a patient who's just had one or see them in clinic having had one sometime before. It was first described by Henri Albert Atman, uh, who lived between uh, 1860 and 1952, a very eminent French surgeon who's also responsible for describing and having named after him Hartman's pouch in the gallbladder. But he's not the same person who invented Hartman's solution, uh, who was a US, uh, an American paediatrician. Um, if you really want to read the original article, uh, there's a reference for it there from 1923. And if you want to read more about this and the man himself, um, there's an article in Techniques in Coloproptology written by Andrew Zabar, uh, which is extremely informative about Hartman. So what are the indications for Hartman's procedure? Well, it's pretty easy, really. Any left-sided, which is normally a sigmoid or a rectal sigmoid pathology, uh, where, when it's resected, making an anastomosis would be unsafe. This is for a variety of reasons. The most common thing is there's some perforated lesion in the sigmoid colon, either diverticular disease or a cancer, and there is generalised peritonitis, a lot of localised pus and abscess, and maybe a phlegmon with the uh, rest of the abdominal contents warning off the pathology, and it's all just a horrible mess when you open up the abdomen. At the same time, we look at the top end of the table, the anaesthetist looking worried, and the uh, the patient has a tachycardia, might be hypotensive, and the anaesthetist is starting some inotropes to try and get things back in line. Now, you remember from earlier podcasts where I said the three most important things about anastomotic healing were blood supply, blood supply, and blood supply. And when the patient's this ill and shocked so that the um, blood supply is in the peripheries rather than perfusing the mesenteric vessels and the patients and inotropes which will constrict the mesenteric vessels there really isn't a guaranteed blood supply to that anastomosis to help it heal so in this situation if you join those two ends of bowel up then there's a high chance that there may be a leak of that anastomosis five to seven days later you've already got a sick patient and what you don't need to do is make them any sicker uh, after a few days just as they're starting to get better by giving them an astomotic leak and having to take them back to theatre. The other emergency situation where Hartman, Hartman's procedure is commonly performed is in large bowel obstruction. It's an obstructing tumour in the sigmoid or rectosigmoid and the colon upstream from this is very distended, looking a little bit ischemic sometimes and quite sorry for itself. So you have some sorry looking colon that's a lot bigger than the distal colon to which you would anastomose the colon. And in times gone by, people worried about there being no bowel prep as well. And so the safe thing to do traditionally would be a Hartman's procedure. So the proximal distended colon is brought out as a stoma. The distal colon after the resection is then stapled over and left inside. A lot of people still do this, and it's not the wrong thing to do. It's certainly safe for the reasons I mentioned earlier. In an elective setting, you might occasionally do a Hartman's procedure. And the most common reason for this is probably a very elderly patient who has a rectal cancer, and uh, you'd normally perform an anterior resection and anastomose the proximal colon onto the mid or mid rectum or the anorectal junction. But elderly people sometimes suffer with continence problems, and you may be worried that their sphincters might not be up to holding on to the more liquid stool after resection of the left side of the colon and the rectum. And so you may discuss this with them and point this out, and they may opt to have an end colostomy uh, where they could be in control of the fecal stream and change the bag and get used to using their colostomy rather than have um, uh, in problems with incontinence after the resection. The other time you might consider a Hartman's in an elective setting is if you've got a very ill patient who has cardiovascular or respiratory disease, which means that the blood flow to that anastomosis might be under threat 
and there will be a higher chance of an asthmatic leak in the elective situation. And so you may again discuss that with them and say that the the bowel has a quite high chance of leaking, the anastomosis has a high chance of leaking, and if that happened, then there would be a significant chance of them dying of that complication. Okay, let's consider the emergency scenario again. So you've got a very ill patient on the ward, uh, you think they have a perforated viscous, probably a perforated colon from the history, and there's plenty of gas on the x-ray, and tender in the left, that fossa, so you think they've got, probably got perforated diverticular disease, let's say. So before you get to theatre, you obviously need to resuscitate the patient. So large bore cannulae, fluid resuscitation, uh, put a catheter in, see how well you're doing with that. Give the patient some oxygen by face mask. Uh, give them some antibiotics. It's very important to give antibiotics as early as possible in the presence of sepsis to decrease the chance of death from sepsis. And uh, arrange for some DVT prophylaxis to be given in theatre or afterwards. It's very important if you've got a chance at all for the patient to be seen by a stoma nurse beforehand. Patients are terrified of having a stoma, uh, often needlessly because of stories they've heard from elderly relatives or uh, people that they've known with a stoma. But having a stoma is not that bad. Uh, once you have one, but the thought of it is really, really terrifying. So it's best to try and prepare the patient as much as possible. Even being seen for half an hour or even less by a stoma nurse beforehand markedly improves the outcome of patients with a stoma. The other important thing is that the stoma can be sited in a place that's convenient for the patient, so not under their belt or not uh, under an overhanging abdomen, which make it difficult to access, and other considerations that the stoma nurse is really expert in. So before you take a patient to theatre, if possible, get the patient seen by a stoma nurse. Okay, so the operation itself. So I'm just going to draw the colon. So it cecums over here, transverse colon, splenic flexure, sigmoid colon, down to the rectum and the anus. Okay. There we are. Okay, so the pathology is going to be here, so either an obstructing cancer, perforated diverticular disease, perforated cancer. And around here is all kinds of horrible inflammation, pus, omentum welded onto this, trying to ward it off, small bowel stuck down onto it, and general sort of just nastiness down here and left in that fossa. What you want to do is Try and identify the structures if you can, and then gently start to mobilise the left side of the colon. You can do this with sharp dissection, with scissors or with diathermy. Often the planes are very hard to find and uh, welded together, so sometimes using the sucker to gently push away bluntly the planes here is quite successful. The other thing you must do is make sure that you identify the ureter, which is going to be running down here before you do any division. Once you've mobilised all this, and depends how long the sigmoid colon is, but you may have to mobilise a splenic flexure as well, is then identify the vessels. So you need to remember that this part of the colon is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery coming off the aorta at about L3, and that will have some branches going up this way, and some branches coming down this way, which eventually goes off to form a superior rectal artery. So you want to try and, if you've got benign disease, you don't have to get the inferior mesenteric artery right up here, and the, the tissue planes are very hard to find in this operation, and so you may just have to divide the mesentery close to the bowel, whatever the pathology is here. And sometimes you don't know what the pathology is until uh, you get the pathology report back, because diverticular disease can sometimes look very much like cancer as well, and vice versa. However, Find the blood vessels here, divide the blood vessel, divide the mesentery, and then, once you've got this bit of bowel isolated, staple across the bowel proximally, and staple across the rectum at the rectosigmoid junction. Try not to go down the rectum too far. When you come back to try and reverse this at a later date, you want to be able to easily find the rectal stump, which by its nature will fall down into the pelvis and become quite difficult to find afterwards. Sometimes what I do is put uh, a, a, a large 
suture in here of um, a non-absorbable material, um, often one of those blue non-absorbable materials such as proline, so it makes it a little bit easier to find if I intend to reverse it later on. Sometimes it can be really very difficult to do, and that's another problem with reversing these heart procedures. Once you've done that, then you need to make sure that there's enough mobility of this proximal colon so that it easily comes out through the skin. And then you want to go to where the stoma nurse has marked where the stoma should go, and then cut a circle around there and, and a circle of fat all the way down to the rectus sheath. Okay, so when you've got down to the rectus sheath, you can see the sheath vertical fibers, the anterior sheath. And then what you want to do is with a knife make a three or four centimeter incision vertically along the line of the fibers and then similarly sized incision across there. And then underneath you'll see again the vertical fibers of the rectus muscle itself. And then put your scissors in between some of these fibers and open the scissors lengthways, so don't cut across the muscle, but open it lengthways just to create a gap through the muscle, and then pop a Langenbeck retractor or something similar either side of that, and retract both ways. Okay, so once you're through the rectus muscle, you find the peristeum, and then open that up, and then make a big enough hole to deliver the stapled off proximal end of the bowel. And once it's through this, uh, skin through the stoma hole that you've made then close the abdomen close the skin and then you can open up the stapled proximal end and then you're left with the lumen like this and then with something like 2o vicorapide put stitches in north, south, east and west, and then in the gaps between, and sew it on to the skin and so on tissue to leave you with an end colostomy, which is flush or slightly powdered from the skin. If you want to know more about colostomies, then have a look at our earlier podcast on stomas, so you can learn about colostomies and ileostomies and other, other stomas. So we look at the bowel now, what we've got left is there's a terminal ileum, And then the sigmoid colon, or descending colon, depending on how much you've taken away, comes up through the skin and colostomy. This bit's been removed, and then the rectal stump, or the rectum, remember not to go too far down the rectum, if possible, is sewn off or stapled off more commonly there. And then that is a Hartman's procedure. So in summary then, Hartman's procedure is a very commonly performed procedure for left-sided lesions and is performed when making an anastomosis is thought to be unsafe. Try and involve the stoma nurse before the operation where possible. And make the patient ready for theatre, so resuscitate the patient with fluids, give oxygen and give antibiotics as soon as you suspect sepsis. That's the thing that you can do to really make a difference and save lives. And then go to theatre and you'll see that the operation proceeds pretty much as described in this podcast. Okay, well I hope you found that helpful and um, there are plenty more podcasts from the School of Surgery. If you go to podomatic.com you can type in School of Surgery in the search bar and uh, find what's now uh, nearly 60 podcasts there to download on various topics to do with surgery. You can do the same uh, if you go to iTunes and uh, go to the podcast part of the iTunes store and type in School of Surgery again and you can subscribe and they will appear in your uh, media player um, as they're published. Uh, and you can also go to our Facebook page, so go to Facebook, type in School of Surgery and like us there and you'll get updates from the Facebook page. So thank you very much for listening and more next week.